Hi, welcome to Deep Sea. This is a channel for experimental cartomancy and astrology. In this video I'll present a fairly complex theory that tries to explain how cartomancy, astrology and also other unusual phenomena like telepathy might actually work. I say might. So it's a theory. Now if you are into astrology or tarot or the I Ching and so on, this uh, theory is very interesting but uh, I have to be honest because understanding it, really getting to the heart of it can be a bit of a challenge. So you'll probably get more out of this video if you already know a little bit about philosophy and if you're familiar with the work of the Swiss psychiatrist and also a shaman Carl Gustav Jung. I'll recommend some books and some interviews in the description so you can check my sources and do your own research. But first I want to say something about these three cards that I have pulled and they are especially for this video. So the first card is about a playground but you cannot play there because uh, there's a red and white thingy there and it says do not enter. In other words, we cannot play. We are going to be serious. Um, that's what I make of it. Um, and on that theme, I mean, this is more or less the same theme. It, 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 this one says to me that what we are going to talk about is it's going to be a hard nut to crack, so to speak. But we'll get it open and, and uh, I hope you will get something from it. And the middle card, that is of course everybody who is watching this video and asking themselves how on earth can cartomancy and astrology work? How can they actually work, like under the hood, so to speak? Well, I hope that from watching this video uh, your, your intuitions about how these things work that they will improve and and maybe it will help you um, choose the right deck for you um, especially in cartomancy um, I think there are some advantages um, you might you might uh, find better questions to ask and so on um, I think for uh, the astrological part it's just um, pure amazement so <laughs> I don't know if it will change your techniques in any way, but it might, I, I'm, I'm not sure. So, I hope you enjoy watching. And by the way, I forgot to say something. These uh, three cards that you're looking at, they are part of the Deep Sea deck. This is a deck that I made myself. Here's, here's a back of one of the cards. Let me put it there. The back of one of the cards. And it's a rather large deck. It, um, I can show it to you. These are 360 cards, so that's quite a bit. And well, I use this because I do not uh, need to shuffle the cards. I can uh, my my intuition is strong enough, so to speak, to um, to pick out the right cards. And uh, and well, I'll I'll tell you some more about it in another video. But now let's get on with the question: How do astrology and cartomancy actually work? Now the answer to that question is synchronicity and that's the short answer. There's a slightly longer answer and that is a very deep kind of synchronicity because there are various kinds of synchronicity. Uh, I'm aware of at least three different ones. For example, you have uh, what I would say is uh, synchronicity for beginners which is uh, about uh, alarm clocks that display 11 minutes after 11, you know. I'm guessing you've seen that. And that is to me more like a meme. It's not really about synchronicity at all. And then there's uh, the popular version, I would say, of, of synchronicity, which is about Carl Jung's famous story where he talks about a scarab beetle. Now. I hope that you've heard of it. I'm, I don't want to repeat it here because it, to me it's almost like a cliché. But uh, I'll show you uh, how, how you can find it. Um, and this type of synchronicity is really about a remarkable meaningful coincidences. Things that are really striking, that, that, that shock you. 
but it still it is only scratching the surface of, of the type of synchronicity that we want to uh, discuss in this video. And that third one, um, it, it more or less permeates um, space and time. It influences everything, like uh, in life, the universe and everything. And well, it uh, m might explain how cartomancy, astrology, telepathy and many other anomalous phenomena, anomalous phenomena might actually work. So, uh, well, to get you started, I want to just say what the general idea is. The general idea is that dreams can be interpreted symbolically, but in the same way, the whole world around you can also be interpreted symbolically. Uh, that, that's basically the, 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 all there is to it, all, all you need to remember. Because uh, you see this with uh, these remarkable kinds of, of um, uh, synchronicities, like the scarab beetle. But uh, what this deep theory is saying is that everyday life is really full of synchronicities. And, but these are staying under our symbolic radar, so to speak. So they are not as spectacular, but they are, on the other hand, they are much more fundamental. And if you want to get an idea of how this is even possible, I think we need to talk about a concept, uh, a philosophical concept that's called idealism. Okay, so what is idealism? Well, it's a philosophical concept. I'll try to explain it to everyone who doesn't know about philosophy. It's not about ideals. It is about ideas without an L in it. And the ultimate source of reality, that's what it's talking about. And it's saying it is not made of stuff, it is not made of matter. Idealism says that reality is made of, or maybe a result of, mental processes. And the word mental, you should, you should see that in a, in a broad sense, I think. And for example, an idealist might say that reality is a bit like a living dream, or even a divine dream. And of course, scientists would say, well, that's nonsense, because uh, they assume, without really thinking it through, that uh, everything is made of stuff. That is what scientists think and say and preach. This view is known as physicalism or materialism. And although materialism is very popular among scientists, which of course gives it some credibility or authority, it is in fact uh, full of problems. For example, uh, after many years of testing in, in physics laboratories, we now know that certain parts of quantum physics simply cannot be reconciled with materialism. And there's also the famous hard problem of consciousness, which says that there is no way that you can explain or, or describe what it is like for you to smell a flower, or what it is like for you, what it feels like to listen to your favorite music and, and describing that only in the language of physics, the so-called laws of physics. You, you cannot do that. That's the hard problem of consciousness. Now there have been some very extreme desperate attempts to save this materialist worldview. For example, we have Mr. Daniel Dennett, a philosopher, who could, by the way, easily be a model for a Renaissance painting of God, but uh, never mind that. But uh, Mr. Dennett, he believes, or he says, that consciousness is an illusion. It simply doesn't exist, according to him. Which is very funny. But I digress. Okay, I would like to introduce a really smart person now. At least I think he's really smart. He's a computer scientist and an idealist philosopher. His name is Bernardo Kastrup. And I should start with an important disclaimer because I'm talking about astrology and cartomancy and it seems to me that Mr. Kastrup doesn't like these subjects. Even though he does quote a book by Richard Tarnas, who is an astrologer, and he does quote Tarnas even in his most rigorous philosophical articles. So that's um, quite amazing to me. But, um, for example, when it comes to divination, uh, Mr. Kastrup does only one I Ching reading per year, and that's it. And I think he just doesn't like astrology too much. He, he gives examples of, of Sunday columns that are fake and so on. Okay, but having said that, 
Bernardo Kestrup is probably the most important idealist philosopher since Carl Jung. And he is also influenced by Carl Jung. Uh, next to Arthur Schopenhauer, and, and yeah, well, I won't get into that. Um, I want to show you a book. Here it is. Um, this is, um, well, I would say uh, the most important um, source for this whole video. So I really recommend that you just buy the book. And um, in it, uh, Bernardo Kastrup explains quite a few Jungian uh, concepts from archetypes to the collective subconscious. And I, uh, that's not actually a chapter title, but, but he goes into the basics of, of Jung's philosophy, so to speak. So Bernardo Kastrup's reading of Jung's whole, whole work, and especially his interpretation of, of the post scarab beetle kind of synchronicity, as I, as I have to call it, that is what I try to explain. So he's, he's the man with the, the ideas, and I try to explain them to you in, in uh, a bit simpler terms. But I hope I, I, hope I manage, but uh, I'm not certain. <laughs> And uh, well, also I have to say something else. Uh, I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I, I try, I like it, but I'm not a real philosopher. And and if you are really interested in a technical level in in what Mr. Kastrup has to say, you really have to, really have to uh, buy the book because he can explain it much better than I can. Of course, I'll put uh, some links in the description. Uh, where you can get this book and, and other work by uh, Bernardo Kastrup and some interviews where he um, tells about this book, which is also very interesting. Okay, so deep synchronicity, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, according to Bernardo Kastrup, the most important thing about Jung's later, deeper theory of synchronicity is that it's more than just a psychological theory. Uh, remember, Jung was a psychiatrist. And here's a quote from Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, the book I just showed you. Its key claim is that in addition to chains of cause and effect, the physical world organizes itself also according to archetypally determined relationships of meaning, just like dreams do. And then Kastrup uh, quotes uh, Jung directly to underline this, and Jung says, It not only seems so, it simply is so, that the archetype fulfills itself not only psychically in the individual, but also objectively outside the individual. Now I hope that you know a little bit about Jungian archetypes, because that really would help to get uh, the, bit, the bigger picture. So you can think of archetypes as primordial or inborn templates of mental activity. Jung de describes it as unconscious but nonetheless active living dispositions, ideas in the platonic sense that preform pre and continually influence our thoughts and feelings and actions. So for example, when we look at the inner life and behavior of a mother towards her child, it is said to be largely determined by the so-called mother archetype. It's a mode of behavior, this mother archetype, that is inherited by every woman and triggered by the presence of her child, according to archetypal theory by Jung. Now let's see what, what Jung has to say, and, and I'll put that quote up again about the reach of archetypes. What Jung is saying here is that archetypes do their thing both inside our skulls, so to speak, and outside our skulls. In other words, they give structure to everything there is. And since archetypes are a part of the collective unconscious, which is another famous Jungian concept, this somehow suggests that ultimately both consciousness and the physical world outside arise from the collective unconscious, which is mental in nature. Now, I really suggest that, especially to understand this point, you, you, you read the book by Bernardo Kastrup or look at some of his interviews, because otherwise I'm sure you will think I'm nuts, but I'm not, I promise. 
So here's how Bernardo Kestrup explains this point, and uh, hold on to your heads. For Jung, the collective unconscious underlies and permeates the whole of space in a non-local fashion. This means that the expression of the archetypes in the physical world is global instead of being restricted by the local constraints of causality, such as the speed of light limit. In other words, archetypal patterns organize the world instantaneously across space, operating within the degrees of freedom that are left open by the indeterminacy of quantum level events. Okay, let that sink in for a moment. And, uh, well, for the skeptics, if you don't trust philosophical talk about quantum mechanics, let me just add here that Bernardo Kessler's first job was at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, where he was researching the huge amounts of data produced by the Large Hadron Collider using state-of-the-art AI techniques. So, uh, just, uh, just giving you some background here. Okay. Now let me repeat the core ideas of deep synchronicity once more, but in different words, and then I hope that you'll start to see that there's some simplicity and some symmetry to it as well. So philosophical idealism says that ultimately all of reality is made of mental processes. And Jung says that archetypes work both inside our minds and in the physical world outside. And occasionally, when the internal and the external aspect of an archetype come together or collide in a very dramatic way, then you get a remarkable coincidence, like maybe a funny story about scarab beetles. So there's a symmetry there. And Carl Jung said it like this, if you don't heed the archetypes in your inner life, they will manifest outside. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. But having said that, Jung also went one step further and he assumed that archetypal structures are in fact much more common and much more fundamental for our whole idea of reality. We can even think of the laws of physics as archetypal according to Jung. Because, for example, he said that numbers are archetypes of order. And, of course, the laws of physics are expressed using numbers. Now, of course, this is all a bit much. I mean, uh, we have a Swiss psychiatrist who uh, wants to rewrite uh, the rules of physics. And he says that um, mental processes are uh, the basis of physical reality, which is uh, remarkable after uh, three or four uh, centuries of uh, materialist brainwashing. So I think uh, I owe you uh, some more context. Because Jung did not come up with his ideas uh, on his own. He was not operating in a vacuum. He was in fact collaborating with one of the great theoretical physicists and thinkers of the 20th century. And that is Mr. Wolfgang Pauli. Now, Wolfgang Pauli, I really like him. He, he was quite a character. He was a Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist. He worked on quantum physics. And uh, together with some of the top, top celebrities in the field, like maybe you know Werner Heisenberg or Niels Bohr. And Pauli also had another side. He was also deeply interested in dream analysis and Carl Jung's theories. So he was, he, he was always talking about the middle path. He was in the middle. And in the 1930s, after Pauli uh, had a personal crisis, he consulted Jung. And when he was feeling better, uh, he started collaborating with Jung. They, they started uh, having discussions and they started uh, writing letters, which are published by the way links in the description and they talked a lot about synchronicity now there's actually a very funny story in here because uh, Pauli was feared by most of his colleagues and not just for his sharp criticism but also he had a, a poltergeist like effect uh, on on equipment it's called the Pauli effect 
and it means that whenever Pauli would enter a physics lab full of sensitive measuring equipment, there would be all kinds of problems. The equipment would break down and, yeah, well, experiments would fail. So at a certain point, uh, the experimental physicists, they just didn't allow Pauli near their equipment anymore. And I, th I really think that's hilarious because there was no physical cause for the so-called Pauli effect. There was only a symbolic cause. Uh, you could call it the revenge of Pauli or something like that. So in some sense, he was a magician who single-handedly took on the principles of materialism and at the same time he was one of the leading minds in theoretical physics. So here's an anecdote. It's the most hilarious example of the Pauli effect and I think it's a better story than the Scarab Beetle but, but that's maybe personal. Anyway, there was another uh, lab experiment that failed. And the professor who was in charge of it, he wrote a letter to Pauli reporting that things had gone wrong, even though Pauli wasn't around. But then Pauli replied and he said, well, on that day that this incident happened, I was in fact traveling by train and at the exact moment when your lab equipment broke down, I was pausing with the train at the station, which is uh, closest uh, to the laboratory. So, <laughs> I think it's a great story and I think it must have been shocking for the professor. But yeah, well, materialists have their own ways of dealing with weird stuff, of course. You can always uh, deny or you can say it's only a coincidence, 10 times, burn some incense and your fears are gone. It's that simple really. But personally speaking, I think this crazy Pauli effect is one of the main reasons why as a person Wolfgang Pauli was so deeply interested in synchronicity. And on the other hand, for the scientist Pauli, the weird world of quantum physics also pointed in a direction of synchronicity on a very deep level. And this was a bit of an obsession for Pauli, for uh, he was looking for a very deep principle of nature that could unite matter and mind. That, that was really what he was looking for. And he hoped to make progress by collaborating with Jung. Now Pauli wasn't er, exactly an idealist in the philosophical sense of the world and that's why his ideas are sometimes a bit different from Jung's ideas. So for example Pauli thought that maybe there would be a very fundamental layer of reality that consists of symbols. And yeah, well, for example, uh, mathematics is purely symbolic. But I think Pauli's um, intuitions are not as sharp as, as Jung's or Bernardo Kostrup's uh, intuitions here. Because when you really look at it, when you want to find a fundamental principle of nature and you call it a symbol, to me, that gives gives you a license to uh, define the word symbol in any way you want. So I'm not really convinced by this uh, idea of Pauli, and I think I think Jung and Kostrup are um, are uh, have have thought it through better. Now there are uh, quite a few books about uh, the relationship between uh, Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung, and I think this one is probably like an entry level type of book that you can uh, actually read without knowing anything about quantum physics and so on. So this would be a nice one, but there are, uh, there are quite a few. And while I'm showing you uh, some books, I have two more here. This is uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, who was um, uh, collaborate, who collaborated with uh, Carl Jung. And in this book, Number and Time, um, she talks a bit about the idea of a number as an archetype of order. You know what I said before. It, it really, she, uh, she had um, so, some uh, quite deep talks with Pauli as well. So um, that's interesting. And another one that is a very good title, I think, Psyche and Matter. That is what all these people were, were thinking about. It was uh, Pauli's fascination, but also Marie-Louise von Franz and, and Jung, they were all occupied with this question of, of, of how, can you, how can we unite the idea of psyche, of mind, with matter? 
and yeah, like I uh, tried to explain, the idealist approach is that uh, not matter is fundamental, like materialists say, but that psyche is fundamental, as idealists say. So that's uh, those are the big lines there. So um, Pauli was thinking about symbols, and uh, Jung and Kastrup are more talking about similarity. Kastrup writes that ultimately uh, Jung extended his definition of synchronicity in the following way, and this one is quite simple. Synchronicity could be understood as an ordering principle by means of which similar things coincide without there being an apparent cause. Really nice and simple, like, like most good theories, like E equals MC square and so on. But here's one more quote from uh, decoding Jung's metaphysics, and this one is not as simple, but I, I'll uh, read it anyway, because I think it kind of ties everything together. All quantum events at a microscopic level must be structured according to some global pattern of similarities. We don't ordinarily recognize this global pattern because its non-local character renders its repetition and study under controlled laboratory conditions impractical. It follows from this, at least according to Castro, that synchronicity, and so far as it defines the structures or tendencies underlying all quantum events, is the only metaphysically real ordering principle in nature. The laws of nature we are familiar with in our daily lives become mere epiphenomena of archetypal synchronicities. Under this broader view of synchronicity, causality isn't a fundamental ordering principle, but a regular compound outline of many microscopic synchronistic events. Now, let me try to translate that quickly for you. It means that the theoretical concept of deep synchronicity is more fundamental than causality. It is also more fundamental than any other laws of physics. And it works on the basis of association by similarity, which is also how the human brain works. Okay, I've uh, tried to... Um, to describe uh, the concept of deep synchronicity and I think it's time now to start uh, connecting it to cartomancy because uh, that's what I promised. Um, so what do you actually need for uh, a cartomantic reading? Uh, well, you need a question, like for instance with these cards it was uh, what will it be like to watch this video. You need a deck of cards, like uh, my uh, homegrown deep sea deck here. You need some rules for interpretation and you need a process uh, of randomization or shuffling of the cards and then you need a valid interpretation of the cards that have been pulled. And now if you are a materialist and you are a bit naive you probably think ah this uh, randomization that could never work uh, that's just not possible how can you get the right cards by shuffling them. So let's look at another long quote from uh, Kastrup's book and see what he has to say about this. Many physicists simply assume that the quantum fluctuations at the foundation of our physical environment do not follow any global pattern. But since complex systems are impractical to study at the quantum level, we can't run a randomness test on their compound quantum behavior to confirm it. For all we know, instead of accidents, quantum events conform to subtle and non-local patterns of organization, corresponding to a yet unacknowledged metaphysical ordering principle different from causality. Uh, and that last, that uh, yet unacknowledged metaphysical ordering principle is of course the deep synchronicity that we've been talking about. Now, here's another quote uh, by Jung again, and uh, you'll see this tendency that Jung quotes are simpler than Kastrup quotes. Here's, here's Jung's idea about uh, randomness in one quote. Within the randomness of the throwing of the dice, a psychic orderedness comes into being. Now, you, you probably cannot put it on a shirt, but personally speaking, I think this is one of my favorite Jung quotes. 
Now, um, I've been uh, reading a, a lot of uh, Bernardo Castro, but I don't want to uh, come across as uh, a Bernardo Castro fanboy per se, because uh, there are some uh, differences. We, we, there's a few things that we look at uh, from a different angle. For example, he writes, we cannot induce a causal event at will. The best we can do is to pay attention to the world around us in the hope of noticing one of them as they spontaneously unfold. Now, I, I don't agree with this because in my opinion, uh, Mr. Kastrup is not being generous enough here. Because I would say that in some sense, all oracles that are based on randomization, whether it's uh, the I Ching or the Tarot or Runes or any other system, um, they are actually creating synchronicities on demand, I would say. Well, at least if the people in charge of the procedures uh, know what they're doing. Okay, before we go on, with the theory, I, I want to uh, address something that is uh, more practical, an uh, ethical matter. So, suppose that someone consults a cartomancer about a romantic relationship. And, and we get the classic question, you know, the question of all questions. Does he or she or they or whatever pronoun this person is not offended by still love me? You know, does X still love me? And then, what do you know, a miracle happens. On demand, the cards come up with an answer that seems to make a lot of sense. Now you may ask yourself, what is the source of the information that was used or, or tapped into in order to get a meaningful answer out of the cards? Now in Jungian terminology, the collective unconscious, the personal unconscious or even the ego consciousness could be the source. Now personally, and this speculating, but okay, it's my opinion, I'd speculate that in the case of this question, does X still love me? The ego consciousness of the person in question is probably the primal source of information. And there's even a way you can verify, if you are a cartomancer, you can verify that it's actually possible to tap into someone's ego consciousness. So you ask someone who, who knows a bit about cards and who knows how to interpret your system to think of a question. But they cannot tell you what the question is. So you are in fact answering a silent question or a private question without knowing what it is. And then you let the cards answer the question and then you ask the person who, who submitted the silent question, so to speak, to verify the answer. And then you will find that the cards have no trouble at all in answering a silent question. I've done this quite a few times myself, and uh, my personal conclusion is that there is clearly a telepathic element to cartomancy. I think in principle it's possible to access the contents of ego consciousness or a personal unconscious just instantly, across distance, even anonymous, uh, where you don't even know who is asking a silent question, you know, as long as there is some kind of connection. Now, does that mean that asking personal questions about other people amounts to some sort of telepathic breach of privacy? I actually think the, the answer is yes. It's probably yes. And I think it's a problem also. And that's why many professional cartomancers, myself included, will not always answer certain types of personal questions. Unless the, the brain that's being picked, so to speak, is, is present during the reading and agrees to cooperate. Okay, back to how cartomancy actually works. Now let's take a look at the cards for a moment. Because, after all, they are the ones that put the cards into cartomancy. And I've got another book here. It's called Cartomancy with the Lenormand and the Tarot. Lenormand is a different type of uh, cartomantic system. It is written by Patrick Dunn, who is a linguist and a magician, which is an interesting combination. And let me just give you one quote. For a divination system to operate well, it must represent a microcosm of the anima mundi's consciousness. It must serve as a psychological map of her awareness, which is the entire universe. 
Now, the anima mundi is another way to refer to what Jung calls the collective unconscious. And Patrick Dunn also says that all good divination systems consist of a network of associated symbols. Now, personally speaking, I really like the way he puts it there, and I think of it as a tightly knit network, I should uh, add. And I would also say that in the process of answering a question, specific cards are being selected or a whole spread of cards materializes on the basis of similarities between on the one hand the symbolic language of the deck that is used and on the other hand the symbolic language of the multiple layers of personal mind and also universal mind that, inv that are involved in the whole process. So these similarities allow for meaning to be created and for a story to be told within the degrees of freedom left open by the deck, so to speak. So if you have a, a, a broad ranging deck, you can have many stories. And what you end up with most of the time is a spread that out of all possible combinations of the cards produces the best starting point for a story or the strongest symbolic resonance or the most meaningful hints and that's what, what helps people uh, to uh, answer the question at hand. So, in conclusion, I think we can say that cartomancy on the basis of the synchronistic aspect of shuffling, on the telepathic contact with personal layers of mind and with universal layers of mind, and using a decent deck of cards with a tightly knit network of associated symbols, actually works on the basis of the general principle of deep synchronicity that underlies the whole process. Well, if you're still watching, you've actually made it to the last part of this video, and that's quite something. So, congratulations. I'll start with another quote from Bernardo Kestrup's book Decoding Jung's Metaphysics. It's uh, the last paragraph of his chapter on synchronicity. And here's what he writes. Notice what Jung is doing. He's extrapolating the natural basis for cognitive associations in the psyche to a natural basis for the organization of all events in nature. He seems to regard the whole universe as a superordinate cosmic mind, greater and more comprehensive consciousness, operating on the principle of association by similarity just like the human psyche does. Now this Jungian cosmic mind metaphor is, is tailor-made for astrological use, I would say. Because if you imagine the night sky as a kind of psycho-physical neural network, if that makes sense, with stars, planets, asteroids and so on acting as symbolic archetypal nodes, and dynamic relations between these nodes or aspects in interconnecting them, then you get basically, in my opinion, the above part of the astrological worldview, which is described by the famous astrological slogan, as above, so below. Nice and short and sweet. Now you can think of this basic astrological equation, so to speak, as a very large-scale example of the principle of association by similarity, which is again uh, the principle of deep synchronicity. So, in other words, using this theory, um, the, the symbolism or the archetype that is associated with each celestial body expresses itself synchronistically on Earth according to its current uh, condition or constellation, whatever you want to call it. And at any time, the total, the sum total of all the interactions between all the symbolic elements at play is uh, what, what we call the astrological weather of the moment. And in principle, I think that's all we need to connect the theory of deep synchronicity to astrological order. But of course, there are many questions that, that are left, uh, like how can you find out which archetype or which symbolism is related to a certain celestial body, and, and why is that? And what about fate and free will? And maybe even more fundamental, uh, should we think of the, 
the messages of the, the night sky as just ornamentation, you know, elaborate symbolic ornamentation? Or is this cosmic communication of astrological order maybe necessary or inevitable? Some, some aspect of the universe that just has to be there? I don't know. I think I'll stop here. And I think I'll save all those difficult questions for another video, because this one is already much too long. And I'll just finish with one last observation. Because I think it's remarkable that the great and wise Bernardo Kestrup, whose, whose book I cannot recommend enough, and, and who, who does not seem interested in astrology at all, he keeps returning to this idea that the inanimate universe as a whole must be, in some sense, uh, like a brain. And here is a last quote from another book by Kestrup, not this one, but uh, another one called The Idea of the World. And it goes like this. The network topology of the universe at its largest scales does resemble that of a brain. So much so that astrophysicist Franco Vazza and neuroscientist Alberto Felletti considered the, re the similarity truly remarkable and striking. A link to the original article of these two scientists is in the description, of course. So, check it out, because uh, in my opinion, this idea of a cosmic mind gives astrologers a very strong and useful metaphor to play with. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. I really hope you were able to follow this explanation from start to finish, or maybe follow it just a little bit. And if you like what you heard, make sure you pick up this book, because it's uh, where, I got, where I got it from. And I think it's a great read, especially if uh, you are interested in philosophy, it will be very rewarding. Now, as you may have noticed, this was my first video. And think of it as a foundation for the videos that will follow. I mean, in, in, in the content sense. Uh, and uh, my next video will have less theory and more practical examples. So it will hopefully be a bit easier on your brain. Uh, in fact, I think I will be talking about using the cards as a universal translator, you know, like the one they have in Star Trek. And uh, if that sounds like fun, well, uh, stay tuned. And uh, if you have questions about these subjects, just leave me a comment, you know what to do. And I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.